what I hope to do is to talk a little bit about, or a good deal about, um, the Frankfurt School today. Uh, then possibly come back to them next semester when we have some more texts by Adorno, Prisms, uh, and we may want to deal with other things of his, but then go on uh, to Derrida uh, in December, uh, not necessarily doing everything, uh, if that's even conceivable, but at least um, beginning uh, on that uh, so that that'll constitute a kind of um, a, kind of link with what we would do uh, in the next term. Now, uh, uh, I may, in fact, I think I'll have to begin talking a little bit about Derrida today in the sense that, um, in, in a way, this is uh, sort of set up for, uh, for, this kind of, uh, for this kind of juxtaposition. And you'll see that in, in, in some ways, the Frankfurt School, this work of the Frankfurt School uh, can seem to be everything that Derrida is criticizing in, uh, in the grammatology uh, and can stand for all of the nostalgias and the metaphysics and so forth, uh, which are the very object of Derrida's critique in that, in that book. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's as simple as that, and I think we have to decide uh, or at least uh, begin to think about what, you know, what, uh, what the adequacy of that critique is uh, uh, next time. But, uh, uh, but nonetheless, I think that's not a bad way of putting these two things together and, and, and making connections. Now, um, uh, I think, though, what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin in a, in a broader way here. Uh, there would be something to say about this, the shift that we're making from essentially from French uh, thought, post-structuralist thought, the thought of the 60s, really, to this um, uh, German or Germanic uh, work in, in what's essentially the Hegelian tradition, uh, work which is really of the 30s and 40s. This book is written during the war in the United States and, and published in 47, I guess, in Amsterdam. Um, uh, and maybe we'll come to that in, in, uh, in a moment because I, no doubt there are questions as to what, uh, what these things are, are doing together. One of the reasons for um, for looking at the Frankfurt School, I think, is uh, is of course that um, it's it's only now come become, beginning to be known, both in English uh, and in French, since uh, we have a few more translations in the French. But until very very recently, uh, none of these things. Uh, I th I think it's safe to say that that uh, almost that uh, that Adorno and Horkheimer, as such, were uh, were almost unknown. That isn't, of course, true of Marcuse, but. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think you'll see that Marcuse looks a little bit different after we see him in the light of this, uh, of, of uh, what's customarily called the, the Frankfurt School itself. That is, in isolation, uh, Marcuse may not focus in, in quite the same way as he, as he will uh, when, we're, when we've talked about this. Um, what I want to begin with, though, uh, uh, is, not, uh, is not the, this, the interference or the antagonism of these two uh, of these two traditions, which in a funny way end up in a in similar positions politically, that is a position uh, in both cases of a kind of view of the world as a as a total system, a kind of seamless uh, web of uh, domination, uh, in which any kind of uh, real political praxis is uh, is impossible. That's at least I think uh, something of the sense that one gets from. Uh, from Foucault, uh, it can come from the epistemes, or it can come from uh, from his own molecular politics, his own political practice, and it's certainly the sense that you get from late uh, late Adorno and Horkheimer, but also uh, substantially in this book too. However, I think uh, before we uh, before we enter on this uh, on a, on a, and have a look at, at this book, I'd like to. Um, Make a larger view of uh, of, uh, of things. This is, of course, uh, very openly a vision of history. Uh, Foucault's work, uh, the books that we read, are histories, but they would prefer not to be seen as visions of history. I think, even though they are, uh, I think we might try for a, a, an even more fundamental 
vision of history then is then is outlined in in, um, uh, in this work and um, laid the basis for uh, a way of of characterizing what um, the Frankfurt School descriptions have in com of the modern world have in common with the, the with what we've seen <coughs> Foucault um, working on. Uh, I, I think the 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 theme, uh, the fundamental theme that one can take, uh, and which it's useful to take, both because it is concrete, uh, and also because uh, it it has the most basic relations to aesthetics and to art and to, to expression and so on too, uh, is that of activity. That is, if you wanted to say that, uh, that things had changed in modern times, that the modern experience of um, the world, thinking, everything else, values and so on, was somehow fundamentally, radically, structurally different from what it had been at other periods, uh, you would have the option of uh, uh, pegging this description or linking it to any number of, uh, of possible themes. Um, you could talk about uh, power, as Foucault does. Uh, you could describe these changes in terms of spatial organization, as he also does. Uh, you, could, uh, you could describe it in terms of writing, the way Derrida does, and, and so on and so forth. That is, obviously, there's an endless number of ways to thematize this, um, uh, this story, the this, this story of this historical changeover, of which we showed the other day that uh, it presents very real problems uh, uh, for, uh, for writing, for narrative, in that um, uh, it's a total kind of thing, and therefore it doesn't thematize itself. And uh, we looked at a, one of the ways that, that Foucault did this in, in, um, in Survey Punir by, uh, what, through what I called the, the, the material interpreter. Well, uh, it seems to me it might be worthwhile to, um, to pick a different uh, theme, and as I say, a more basic one, uh, which would be that of activity and the very nature of, of human action in different societies. I want to read you first a uh, passage from a, an ethnological document. This is a... Um, a uh, uh, narrative of, uh, of a Brazilian woman who was captured when she was, oh, I think uh, eight or nine by the, uh, by the Indians uh, and only rescued then, if that's the word, um, uh, when she was in her 20s or 30s uh, and therefore she uh, learned Indian language and, and, uh, and this is it's a very interesting document called Yanoyama. Uh, it was uh, 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 recorded by Italian <coughs> ethnographers, and there's an English translation. Uh, I want to give a uh, I want to give an excerpt from this uh, to show you something which is familiar to us in other um, from from other angles in uh, in things like uh, Levi Strauss. That is uh, obviously what you're going to hear is something which uh, is now customarily called pensée sauvage or uh, Primitive thought, mythic thought, that's it's an untranslatable uh, expression, wild, natural, natural thought. But I think after you hear this, you'll understand that the way Lévi-Strauss describes it to us is very intellectualized in the sense that uh, he's out to prove that, uh, that there is a primitive science, primitive classification systems, and all those things. Uh, and therefore, uh, his descriptions of the way, uh, the way uh, primitive peoples think and then the kinds of stories they tell and the way they think through telling stories, uh, those descriptions are somehow nonetheless slanted towards the conceptual and towards, uh, the, um, uh, towards the function of knowing the world. Uh, but it will be clear in this uh, description, it's a description of making poison of the, uh, the uh, curare, uh, uh, the production of curare, um, it will be clear, and this is a productive process. This is how the Indians, uh, this is how the Indians kill animals. That's how they, um, that's how they wage warfare, uh, and therefore uh, this is, can be thought of as part of the part of the uh, uh, productive forces of a, of a of a primitive society like this. Um, 
Let me just read uh, a few excerpts from this description. Uh, she talks about how uh, many other times I've seen how they prepare the curare. They look in the hills for some large vines which don't grow in the lower regions and which they call mamakori, like the poison. These have short branches which end like hooks and so on and so on. Uh, they had once built tapiri, which I kind of hot, I guess, uh, to protect themselves from the rain. Because, they say, the weather grows dark, it's the master of the poison who's protesting, which is to say, I would, I would assume, that uh, it isn't, the, the, the weather is clear, but the, the master of the poison, who is in charge of this process, uh, is, uh, is telling him it's going to rain, you know, when it really isn't. Then they scrape the trunks on large leaves and make sure it doesn't rain on the part they've scraped, for otherwise the poison will be weak. Uh, this they, then they enclose the scraped part in big packets of leaves, put them in their baskets, and so on and so on. The next morning, all the men who had to prepare the curare had painted themselves black with coal on the face, on the body, on the legs, because they said curare is useful for war. They didn't eat that day. They said that the women who stayed to watch must not bathe because the poison would no longer kill animals or men. Pregnant women must not be present because they said the babies whom they carried in their stomachs make water on the poison and the poison becomes weak. I assume that's amniotic fluid that, that, that this alludes to. I don't know. Uh, they do not begin to prepare the poison too soon, that is too early in the day, uh, because at that time the deer is still walking about in the wood and urinating the deer urinates a long way off, but for them, he urinates on the poison and makes it weak. Towards six o'clock in the morning, Rohariri and the others went into the forest to gather other plants and so on and so on. Uh, now, uh, he, this, the master of the poison, sent two children to get water from the Igarape and said they must not put their feet in the water, but on trunks and roots. If they had got wet, he would send others. Uh, finally, uh, when they prepare the poison, they don't touch water, and then they don't wash uh, their hands in water, but they clean them with leaves. They say that their hands are still very bitter after two days. Tomorrow we shall try the poison, said Ro Riri at, at last. Be careful not to shoot the Uisha monkey, otherwise all the arrowheads we've prepared will grow moldy. The Uisha is a bearded, ashen-colored monkey the male's long-tailed, the female's short-tailed. They say that they can be killed only with old poison. Um, the next day, tomorrow morning, uh, all right, pick up the rest of your poison, uh, dig a hole in the ground, cover it up. Tomorrow morning, you go on uh, putting it on your arrowheads. The next day, I saw him shoot a monkey on a tree. The animal did not fall right, right away, but kept on jumping among the branches then sat down, looked down, urinated, and remained there like a drunken man. Then it hung itself up by the tail. Then Roariri shouted, the poison is bad. I told you not to go with women. Now the poison is spoiled. If the enemy come, you won't be able to kill them. You'll only be able to give them pain with your arrows. They went back into the shapuno, scraped everything, and made new poison. Uh, and so forth. Um, now, what I want to get at is, uh, uh, that is, we, we know from the descriptions of, of uh, from all kinds of ethnological descriptions, but, but in particular from Lévi-Strauss on, on Pensée Sauvage, how um, the uh, various, um, the, the, the objects of, of primitive thought form constellations or systems so that uh, clearly you have uh, basic conceptual oppositions between um, uh, certain kinds of, uh, between various kinds of liquids, for example, between concentrated uh, liquids of this, uh, of the type of this poison that get very thick, uh, water, urine, and, and so forth. Uh, and that these things are thought to be um, in immediate relationship, uh, relationship to each other. That is, that uh, they are, they have their, their conceptual relationship is, a, is also an antagonism in the real world, and the real world is somehow organized around these things. Uh, now, uh, we can't really say from this uh, very much more about the, 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 the structure of this kind of thinking, and uh, no doubt uh, Alevi Stos would find, for example, this Uisha monkey that's mentioned, it would be very interesting uh, to, to pose oneself the kind of problem that Levi Stos does because he sets up his work essentially as a detective story. He says, um, here we have uh, a certain type of mask or a certain type of belief, 
certain type of what seems to be a very aberrant linking of, of, of two different things, how can one, by reconstructing the whole systematic and conceptual background of this particular myth or belief, in this case, the idea that this one monkey must be killed with old poison, can't be killed with new, new poison, or it will, uh, it'll, it'll destroy the, the effect of the poison. Uh, and Lévi-Strauss, uh, finally, by de through a detour through numerous seemingly very distant uh, and unrelated myths, uh, constructs a theory of the way in which this monkey, for whatever properties that is, it may be on account of uh, particular uh, physical properties or because of things it eats or because of, um, uh, because of its coloration or, 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 or its habitat or whatever, uh, this monkey then uh, is a kind of sign which has a certain number of elements in it uh, and which doesn't go with the other sign or with the other, uh, with the other object which is, uh, uh, which is the poison. And suddenly, uh, having reconstructed that whole, um, that whole complex of, uh, of thought, uh, this, uh, th this uh, prohibition would cease to be opaque for us and would become <coughs> transparent like a language that, we, that, we're, that we're learning and that we suddenly understand. That is, it would, it would, be, it would become, uh, on our level, let's say, on the level of Western science, it, it would remain uh, preposterous and, and, uh, and contrary to all of our uh, biological causality and so forth. But on the level of, of, of science systems, uh, it would now make sense. That is, it would be clear why this monkey and this object didn't go together, and, uh, and the sign would, be, uh, would, would have become, um, would have lost this, um, this mystery and uh, uh, figural density that it has for us. Now, uh, we can't do that. Indeed, uh, it's not clear whether the, whether the woman telling the story uh, is aware of these things or not, to what degree really uh, a child uh, transplanted into this tribe comes to understand these things in the way that, uh, the, in the way that, that a native does or, or not. What I wanted to get at, though, was something rather different. I'm trying to, to, um, to make a kind of emblematic picture of possible relationships between uh, activity and abstraction. Uh, I'm already alluding, therefore, to the opening pages of, of Adorno and Horkheimer, where they talk, you remember, about uh, there's some very odd things in here about sacrifice. They say. Uh, among other things, sacrifice is already a kind of mode of scientific thought. Uh, sacrifice looks primitive to us. It looks um, theological or, or magical or something, uh, superstitious and all the rest of it. Yet, in a different sense, uh, it's already a forerunner of our science because sacrifice involves the first, um, uh, the, the, one of the most basic gestures of scientific thought, which is uh, equivalence, abstraction, substitution. If you can sacrifice for the human being who should be given to the god, an animal. If you can sacrifice for the animal that maybe you can't catch or whatever, uh, now uh, a symbolic form, uh, an image, uh, already you've begun to institute a process of substitution. That is to say, uh, the original situation uh, is now at several removes. Uh, and we're beginning to practice on that situation uh, a, a, a kind of process of abstraction by which uh, the original situation, the human sacrifice, propitiation of the gods uh, through, human, uh, through human death, uh, is now felt to be the same and thus replaceable by a situation in which an animal is sacrificed, finally a, uh, uh, an image, uh, and finally a prayer just the expression of a, uh, the, the mere verbal expression of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, obeisance. Now, um, uh, whatever the value of that theory of sacrifice, and it's, uh, it's sort of peculiar from an anthropolog anthropological point of view, it seems to me, I mean, it, it, it seems rather old-fashioned, these, these pages in Dialectic of Enlightenment. Whatever the value of that, let's take that as a, uh, as a symbolic expression of, uh, the, of the process that interests us uh, right now, namely how an activity uh, ceases, is torn away from its, 
uh, its rootedness in a unique situation in the world. How it becomes detachable, repeatable, reproducible, and thus little by little abstract. This is the trajectory that I want to describe in these three, uh, in these three moments that, of which I've already given you one. Because it seems to me that the, the image of the poison making, as well as we can imagine, uh, because we can't, we can't imagine a situation after all in which there's no abstraction at all. That would be a kind of zero degree of, uh, of, of, of consciousness of activity. Uh, it's true that uh, some writers who, who deal with historical change feel the need to have the fiction of a kind of zero degree like that. And we'll see that when we come to Deleuze and, and uh, Gattari, uh, there the fiction of the zero degree, the absolute absence of abstraction, is simply called schizophrenia. Because uh, in, uh, at least in the Lacanian theory of schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenia is uh, the break, the breakdown of <coughs> linguistic connections between things. So that you have, um, you have an immediate and very intense sense of this, the situation, the here and now, but um, abstraction isn't possible anymore. That is, you don't, uh, you see this configuration of matter but it has nothing to do with uh, th this, which we would call a table, has nothing to do with some other table that you see at some other moment, uh, because you don't any longer have the, uh, either the, the words which make those links or establish those equivalences, or the, or the corresponding thought pattern. So that um, schizophrenia uh, figures in Deleuze and Guattari a kind of zero degree of absolute oneness with uh, the environment and with the situation, uh, the, the extinction of language and a kind of a complete, um, uh, complete indistinction with the, uh, with the universe. Now clearly, uh, that, that being the case, it's, it's a useful fiction because it, at least it shows us that uh, we can't imagine any, uh, any, any, uh, any social situation which would be similarly uh, at one with uh, with uh, with the environment, uh, in, and even in animal life, clearly there's something, there's some process of abstraction going on, and there's a, uh, there are uh, there there are techniques, and there's a, there are, there are animal languages which are uh, which aim at um, uh, which aim at, um, uh, for example, the language of the bees, which tells the other bees where the honey is, and so on, which are clear evidences of a certain form of of uh, of repro reproducibility and, and equivalence and, uh, and so forth. Um, nonetheless, it seems to me that this uh, image of the, uh, of the poison does give us a, a picture of situationality, of being rooted in, uh, in, in, in a particular place, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the deep sort of fundamental links between doing a certain thing and doing it in a place, and, and the connections between that thing and everything else that's going on uh, in that place and in the world about it, gives us a much more intense picture of that than anything we can find in, in, um, uh, in modern life. That is, uh, the, here's, a, here's a, um, a type of activity uh, which um, our activities are generally separable from in time and in space. That is, uh, uh, we arrange, uh, if we're making something, uh, there's a place that you make it, and it doesn't matter what's outside of that. That's the very definition of the city, right? That that uh, that you one can separate activities out in such a way that they have no organic links with with uh, with anything else. Uh, so also in time, presumably our kinds of productive activity could happen uh, night or day or whatever. Well, here uh, the the moment of time is not indifferent. Uh, it must not be in the very early morning when the animals are about. Uh, when the animals are urinating, because the water, uh, the the the, uh, the water of the animal and the poison, and the the making of the poison don't go together. Uh, everything else in space is is somehow profoundly in uh, uh, entertains some kind of profound complicity or antagonism uh, with this process, um, uh, and so forth. Um, now uh, here we'll, we we would say obviously it is a repeatable activity because the master of the poison has a skill. The skill is passed down, but but it's a controlled repeatability. That is, this is passed down presumably 
presumably the master of the poison is a uh, has has a is is a is a sacred function, uh, and this is passed down to a successor who is somehow chosen. I don't know either by uh, this could either be by inheritance or by uh, or by some other form of choice, uh, in the way that shamans are chosen and so on. Uh, and this is sacred knowledge, and not everybody's supposed to know this, and it's, conv and it's conveyed in formulaic ways and so on. So there's a great deal besides the relationship of um, of the activity to uh, to its environment, which underscores at least the the, the distance between this. Uh, non the, the, which underscores the non-generalizability of, um, of this activity, which tries to keep it non-generalizable. Now, um, and then you would want to know, uh, you know, how, uh, how, what are the words in a, in, in a language of this kind? That is, is there, uh, is there, there must surely be a special word for, for, for the making of poison. Is it a word that could correspond to anything else? What forms of abstractions, how do people think about activity, what we later on will call work? Do they have a word uh, that would include uh, making poison, hunting, uh, weaving baskets? Uh, or is that, active, is, is that kind of abstraction uh, not yet developed uh, in their language? Those are things that I think uh, it would be interesting, but not necessarily con conclusive to know. Our, our own particular myth of, uh, of all of this is that um, uh, at least a, the privileged moment in which abstractions of that kind come into being uh, is that of ancient Greece. And this is called the, the um, emergence of philosophy. This philosophy is the moment when you pass from pensée sauvage to abstraction, and when abstraction itself is born, and when and even in pre-Socratic philosophy, you can see that this, the tangibly the separating out of abstract concepts from material concepts. When uh, when the pre-Socratics wonder whether the world is fire or water, or whatever, obviously there's a there's an effort to disengage from uh, from unique material things, uh, abstract notions, and that will then be, be uh, Plato finally. Uh, well, uh, th one, can, uh, one can talk about this then uh, more generally in terms of the Pensée Sauvage, and, and, I'll, uh, and I'll read the final paragraph in this before I go on. Uh, in the Rosa, near the tobacco plants, the men cultivate in secret certain magic plants for hunting and for war. They're especially those kinds of onions which grow underground. They tear off the branches. Now, Elevis Tos, again, would be able to tell us why these things growing underground are, have a special consonance uh, with hunting and with hunting certain things, but we don't know. They tear off the branches and the leaves and cover the roots with the bark of trees so that, so that other men cannot find and steal them. The women do not know them or pretend not to know them. For hunting the tapir, they use the onion of a piripirioca, which is shaped something like a tapir's eye. Well, there's an explanation. They let it dry by the fire, then they mash it up and rub it mixed with uruku on their own bodies, on the arrows and on the noses and paws of the dogs. The juice has a stupefying action. It should also stupefy the tapir, allowing the hunters to come close to him. For every animal, there is a magic plant. Uh, the wild pig is hunted after men, arrows, and dogs have been rubbed with a root shaped like, shaped like the pig snout. The mudum bird, the toucan parrots, monkeys, armadillos, and so on, all have their plants. Well, again, this is another uh, illustration, not now so much of these older uh, ideas about sympathetic magic and so on that we all know, or, or Ponce de Sauvage, as, as the, 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 the way in which each of these activities is qualitatively different. Thus, we can even go further. We can say, uh, presumably, there isn't really a concept of hunting, per se. There is a concept of hunting this kind of animal, this kind of bird, this kind of uh, uh, fishing for this kind of fish, and so forth. And this is a state, uh, therefore, uh, in which um, a, the very concept of activity can't yet come into being. So there is, an abs there is a lack of abstraction uh, on the level of language and thought, uh, when you feel each of these activities to be radically different from each other one, uh, obviously you're not in any position to uh, understand what's common to all of them as human activity or as a production of value. Uh, th so there's this 
uh, a lack of abstraction on the level of thought or on the side of the subject, if you want to use a Hegelian dialectical kind of scheme. But there is also lack of abstraction in the things themselves, in reality, in people's lives, on the side of the object. Uh, and this is a kind of uh, life uh, activity which is, not yet, which is not yet known to any appreciable degree the force of abstraction as we're uh, trying to evoke it here. Okay, now uh, then the next step presumably would be that of, um, of ancient Greece. I draw here on uh, Jean-Pierre Vernon's um, the very important essays on work in Mite et Pensée uh, dans la Grèce ancienne, in which uh, he tries to give uh, uh, succeeds in giving a good deal of detail to uh, Marx's idea that uh, Greek, the Greek thought, uh, this is essentially both Plato and Aristotle, mostly Aristotle, the Greek thought about activity um, was essentially dominated by and thus limited by use value. Uh, I should say, I guess, I don't know if we've used these terms before, but uh, Marxism distinguishes between use value and exchange value. Um, and I think when I'm through with this series of um, images, you'll understand a little better what that, what that distinction, um, uh, what that uh, distinction uh, amounts to. Let me just uh, briefly translate or summarize a few of these uh, remarks of Vernon who is concerned to show several things. First of all, that uh, production uh, of a handicraft type is, first of all, in Greece, felt to be radically different from agriculture. So agriculture is a sacred activity. It isn't necessarily uh, demeaning or humiliating, as witnessed the moment uh, in the Odyssey when uh, Odysseus says to one of the suitors, you know, uh, yoka, uh, yoke a plow, uh, yoke two plows, and we'll uh, plow a field side by side, and we'll see which one is the stronger and which lasts the longer, and so on and so on. This is obviously, therefore, not, not a servile, uh, not, a, not necessarily a servile um, uh, uh, kind of thing, agriculture. And indeed, um, the uh, Greek thought about servility and so on is really essentially blocked out by, uh, by the question of whether you're working for somebody else or not uh, because uh, freedom in the, um, in the classical Greek sense is always means uh, being independent of other people, not having to work for other people. Uh, so that the lowest of the low is not someone who, uh, that's the other passage in, uh, in the Odyssey when, uh, remember Achilles says, I'd rather be alive the word is uh, thetis, is that the, anybody? Oh, well. than, uh, than, uh, uh, than, a, than a dead hero. The, um, the, word, the Greek word uh, is, um, uh, is uh, people who have to sell their labor for hire. That is, people who, don't, who aren't part of a manor, who aren't part of an estate or, or a generalized family, who have, to go, who, have no, who have no tools of their own, who are simple uh, day, day laborers and, and therefore who are felt to be lower than slaves in the sense that they really absolutely depend on the mercy of other people, where a slave is, is at least part of a, part of a social uh, organism. Um, so that, uh, so that uh, there cannot be a Greek idea of production uh, because, uh, because the Greeks can't think together things that we now see are, uh, are all parts of the same picture. They can't think agricultural production uh, within the same conceptual framework as um, the production of objects. And as for other kinds of activity, those are understood to be radically different because those are what are generally called praxis uh, in, in, the, in the Aristotelian sense are uh, the activity of aristocrats and, and a people who m and are, are essentially political activity, that is, uh, activity which is not for anybody else, but which you decide for yourself. That kind of activity, praxis, is radically distinguished from poesis, which has a um, making, which has a, um, uh, a, a connotation of, um, of a certain uh, degradation. Now, uh, 
even within the thought of the Greeks about, um, about making and what it is, after we've separated out uh, the relations with nature that you find in, in agriculture and the relations with, um, with, the, with, the, with the polis that you find in, 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 in praxis and political activity, uh, there are still basic limits to, um, to, Greek, uh, to Greek thinking on these, um, uh, on these, uh, on the structure of, of this activity. The, the basic um, model or, or uh, description of activity that, that we have in, um, uh, in, in any of these texts is Aristotle's description of the four causes. Uh, how, a, how a thing comes into being uh, is to be explained in a fourfold way by reference to its um, material cause, what, what it's made out of, its efficient cause, who makes it, and that's the place of the worker after all, and you see that it's a very subordinate place. Uh, its formal cause, what it is, what it is, a, 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 what it is reproduced from, or what it's modeled from. So that would be um, the vase, the, the the shape of the vase, which the vase maker is, is making. What he, what he, what he, how, how he makes a new vase uh, uh, that has the same form, and fine, and and its final cause, that is uh, the use of the um, of the object that that he is. Um, that he is making. Now, uh, in a sense, I guess we could say that um, uh, Greek thought about these things collapses the two final, the, the two final causes because they are, in a sense, uh, they, they are, in a sense, identified, the final cause and the formal cause. When we say that the Greek thought about making things is dominated by use value, we mean that formal and final causes are essentially the same. What's different is the... Uh, is the point of view. Uh, you, you, the formal cause becomes visible when we ask how the workman uh, makes this. What is, he, what is his pattern for it? The final cause, what the thing is used for, becomes visible when we ask who he's going to sell it to. Because essentially that's what's meant by the final cause. That is, who is the person uh, for whom this... Um, what, what is the need? What is the need to be satisfied by this... Um, uh, by this object. Uh, and uh, according to Vernon, the picture of needs uh, is um, not an infinite one as it, as it is in consumer society, right? Where, but then the whole idea of need becomes very problematical and we don't know whether what that concept is good for anymore and so on. But clearly in consumer society, uh, one can imagine uh, and business is uh, intent on imagining uh, a whole uh, infinite production of possible, uh, of possible needs and objects which are to correspond to them. In Greek thought, these needs are uh, perhaps vast but uh, not infinite in number, and they are all ultimately grounded in human nature. So a certain notion of human nature and of natural needs limits uh, Greek thinking on uh, production just as it limits production itself because uh, that's the other way of saying this, that you don't, uh, that there, there, there isn't the kind of explosion of production in, in ancient Greece that there is today uh, because, well, the word because is maybe not the right word here, but uh, to, to, to describe uh, the, the limits on thinking about this phenomenon is the same as describing the objective limits of the phenomenon itself. All right, now let me just read you, uh, read you a page or two, uh, a paragraph or two of Vernon's description of this. Uh. Yeah, um, thus the, the formula division of work can only be applied uh, uh, to, the, to antiquity with certain reservations. It is anachronistic psychologically to the degree to which it implies, notion of division of work, a representation of the métier in its relationship to production in general. But that isn't, that isn't there. There is not an idea of production in general, of which the various métiers or professions would be uh, uh, so many variants or, or specifications. There are only the separate professions themselves. Um, uh, the, the, the Greek did not see professions or métiers in this perspective. 
They, were, they presented themselves to him doubly. Uh, they suppose, on the one hand, uh, in, the, uh, in the artisan who uh, exercises uh, the, the métier, a particular dunamis, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a particular kind of activity, and in um, the person who uses the product of the métier, <coughs> a créa or a need. The division of activities comes from the contradiction between these two aspects of the métier. To the multiplicity of needs is in each one opposed <coughs> the limitation of his capacities. The division of, um, of activities is therefore not felt as an, as an institution whose aim would be to give work in general its maximum of productive efficiency, it is rather a necessity inscribed in the nature of man who does one thing, uh, who, who does one thing well uh, to the degree uh, to which he does only that one thing. Uh, these technical capacities which the division of, of activities uh, is to, uh, ought to bring to, to their perfection are, appear as natural qualities. Uh, okay, then uh, we have uh, essentially the description I just gave you of the, of the final cause, the, the idea that the artisan, the workman, is, is, a, um, is the efficient cause. Um, this, the real causality of the operatory process uh, does not reside in the artisan, but outside of him in the product that's made. Uh, and thus, uh, it's in that sense that the, um, that the form of this activity is preserved by the, pro the form of the product. Uh, in other words, the, the unity, uh, there is an ultimate unity of the product which, which isn't going to be destroyed. Uh, and this unity, uh, no matter how complicated the making will become, uh, this unity will assure a certain unity of, um, uh, uh, of work. Um, okay. Uh, it is uh, uh, an immutable uh, and uncaused model uh, which defines itself in, ter in final terms uh, with respect to the need uh, which uh, the object is to satisfy uh, in its user. Uh, it is always the end of the process, the form uh, realized in the work, which is the principle and the source of the whole operation. The efficient cause is not really productive. It, it plays the part of a means by which a certain pre-existing pre form actualizes itself in raw material. Now, um, this business of the of the of the end of the uh, of of the whole process is uh, it's it's very hard to use this term as you'll see in a minute. But it seems to me that the key thing that we want to keep in mind about this stage in uh, in the development of activity is the imminence of the end to the process itself. The end isn't something outside of the process. It's the very uh, it, it's the very source of the process. It informs all of the moments. It preserves the unity of the process. Okay, thus one, uh, one identical structure uh, may be found at, all, uh, at, at various levels of, soci of, of Greek society and culture. On the economic level, use value is dominant over, uh, over exchange value. The product is seen in function uh, as a function of the, s of the service uh, it will render and not of the work uh, uh, placed into them. Now, what's, what's, what's meant here uh, is simply that um, the value of the thing uh, will depend on, um, on the nature of your need for it, where uh, in modern times uh, the, the value of, a, of an object, it's uh, ultimately its price, but, but even before that its value, uh, has to do with uh, the amount of work labor time that's uh, inscribed in the object. So it can be as base a need, uh, it can satisfy as base a need as you like or false needs or anything, but uh, its, its price, its exchange value will ultimately uh, result from, um, from uh, the investment of work. 
This isn't the case uh, for this um, uh, for, 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 the, for this culture, for this economy, uh, or for this thinking about uh, economy. And indeed, you can see very easily why uh, this would be characteristic of a, of a slave economy, that, um, uh, that it isn't necessary to take into account, or it isn't as important to take into account uh, how, much, um, how much work time uh, a slave has to invest in a, in a certain product. What's, what's essential is whether you uh, what your relationship as a consumer to that, to that product is, how you use it. Okay, that's the economic level and the philosophical level. The final cause, that uh, in, in view of, uh, of which uh, each thing is, is produced, uh, dominates, uh, is dominant over the efficient cause, that by which the thing uh, was made. On the psychological level, the product, the realized and finished product, uh, which is, is, uh, is, is prepared for consumption, is dominant over the point of view of the act, the energia, the laborious effort of the producer. Uh, praxis, which, confers, direct, which uh, uh, confers on the agent the use of his, uh, of his action, is dominant as a, as a type of activity over poesis, uh, the productive activity, which um, places its producer by the intermediary of the object produced under the dependency and in the personal service of the consumer. Okay, now this is then a, uh, an intermediary stage between uh, in, in the emergence of abstraction, in the way in which activity is organized uh, uh, abstractly and separated from its world of... Uh, from its immediate situation, from its Umwelt, its Lebenswelt, whatever you like. Uh, we've seen in this that it isn't completely separated. That is, uh, it's still uh, tied to that world by, um, essentially, by um, concepts of human nature, uh, uh, need, uh, and ultimately by use value and so on. Well, the final stage is, of course, our own, which is that of, of exchange value, and uh, at the same time of the absolute um, divisibility of work, and I uh, quote here, there will be lots of examples one could use, but um, uh, I have a quote from Braverman's um, uh, Labor and Monopoly Capital, which describes what he calls, it's, a, it's an assembly line in meatpacking, which is, however, really a disassembly line uh, and can be taken also uh, in anticipation of our next session as an example of some kind of deconstruction. Anyway, um, here is, uh, this isn't Braverman, this is someone he's quoting. Uh, here's the description of, uh, of this uh, process, which is quite different from anything we've seen so far. It would be difficult to find another industry where division of labor has been so ingeniously and microscopically worked out. The animal has been surveyed and laid off like a map, and the men have been classified in over 30 specialties and 20 rates of pay from 16, 16 cents to 50 cents an hour. The 50 cent man is restricted to using the knife on the most delicate parts of the hide, the floor man, or to using the ax and splitting the backbone, the splitter. And wherever a less skilled man can be slipped in at 18 cents, 18 and a half cents, 20, 21, 22 and a half, 24, 25 cents, and so on, a place is made for him and an occupation mapped out. In working on the hide alone, there are nine positions at eight different rates of pay. A 20 cent man pulls off the tail, a 22 and a half cent man pounds off another part where good leather is not found, and the knife of the 40 cent man cuts a different texture and has a different feel from that of the 50 cent man. Well, it, Taylorism and this kind of uh, uh, this kind of division of labor is clearly it marks not not a development out of uh, uh, out of what we've described in in the articulation of of work uh, in ancient Greece but a radical break from it. That is, at this point, uh, the activity, there is no, no longer any necessary unity uh, in this activity. Uh, it is infinitely, um, it, it may be infinitely fragmented and divided up. And of course, uh, if you want to, you can, uh, you can uh, juxtapose in this ideogram uh, the, the, the very 
use of, uh, un unlike the, the kind of analysis Aristotle makes, uh, which is a, still an articulation of, of, a, of, an ob of, of a process that has uh, qualities and in which have a qualitative relationship to each other and has a kind of organic unity, uh, you can juxtapose Descartes' description of method, that is the way that uh, you break everything up into its smallest component parts, think each of those separately, put it all back together in a kind of additive way, something like this. Um, uh, and one can also think then of the Cartesian idea of extension, that uh, the real substratum of the universe is not uh, one of qualities anymore uh, of, uh, of the uh, so-called um, I get these mixed up, but I guess of the secondary senses, that is the real world uh, is not a matter of, uh, of smells or, uh, or tastes or, or, or things of that kind, but really uh, uh, essentially a matter of um, extension uh, and of, uh, uh, therefore of, the, of that, which is, that which is measurable, that which is infinitely divisible, that which is quantifiable as opposed to the qualities of, the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of this sensory level of the world, which is now shown to be illusion for, uh, for modern scientific, or which is shown to be, let's say, subjective, because that's our word for, for uh, that's the way in which we deal with these secondary things which are not uh, parts of the most genuine measurable uh, realities that, uh, that uh, uh, that we that we see as as um, uh, as the basis of of, uh, of being or the world or, or whatever. Uh, now it's clear then that um, where uh, Greek thought is dominated, one one of the ways we can describe this is uh, as a shift from uh, a uh, an, an experience of the world dominated by qualities uh, to one uh, dominated by quantity. Uh, and quantification and divisibility uh, and all the rest of it, and that this is surely uh, one of the most fundamental features of what I'm calling uh, abstraction. Uh, that is, um, it has to be uh, in a world in which every, um, in which space is sacred, as we were saying the other day in connection with something else, uh, in which one type of space, uh, w in which some parts of space are central uh, and others are, uh, are less central, in which you approach uh, the, the center, the navel of the universe in, in, at one place, uh, in which approaching the presence of the king is approaching some kind of sacred centrality uh, and moving away from it is moving into qualitatively different kinds of space. Indeed, in which uh, the very organization of the world is around centrality and, uh, and the cities are built on... Uh, uh, on the model of the, uh, of the, and th this would be, I guess, if we wanted pictures, uh, you can, you can uh, compare Foucault's picture of modern <coughs> space with this other kind, which looks like it, but which is not, that is the organization of everything in terms of the four points of the compass in such a way that uh, the, the king or the forbidden city or whatever is at the center, uh, and, but then everything else is built on this pattern. So, uh, so the individual houses are built with a center. The world is organized around a center. And then when you want to do uh, various kinds of things like um, practices of divination, uh, you, uh, you do that by, if it's a question of, uh, uh, of bird signs, of uh, dividing the sky into these, uh, in, 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 these, uh, in this way and seeing the emergence of a certain, um, uh, certain constellation of bird flights in, uh, in, in, one part of this, um, uh, in one part of this organized space. Well, clearly a um, uh, space which is, uh, which is qualitative uh, in that kind um, is, not, is not under the, the law of equivalence uh, because the space that's at, that's at the center is more other uh, more intense, has more power, is more valuable than the space that's on the outside and that pr presumably is, uh, is desert or where barbarians dwell or, or, or whatever. Um, so, that, um, so that the coming into being uh, of equivalence, uh, well, one can describe this either way, uh, the coming into being of quantified world uh, is the, uh, the destruction of that kind of space 
and its replacement with a type of space in which everything is equivalent to everything else. If you can measure space, uh, then that means that at least from the point of view of measurement, every bit of space is the equivalent of everything else. And that's what's meant by, essentially, by, uh, by extension. Um, from there to the idea of, obviously, what goes along with that is also quantification of time. I think we've mentioned that uh, already in other contexts. Um, and, and ultimately then, the kind of Taylorism uh, that, this, that this describes, namely the way that you, uh, you, 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 break, you break down time into its least common denominators and you reorganize it in, in, uh, in ways that are more efficient, just as you do the same, uh, as you do the same uh, with space. Another way of saying this, and this is some of this by way of introducing these things in, in as Adorno and Horkheimer use them. Another way of talking about this is that is in terms of increasing formalization. That is, uh, and again, this is a this is a particular code. And if this means if this code is useful to you, then it is handy to use it. And if it's alien, then maybe it's not not worth uh, bothering with. It's a Hegelian code. But, uh, but it does seem to, to shed a little fresh light on this whole business. Uh, if we use this particular code, we could say that um, there is more content in, uh, in the way in which primitive man thinks about activities. That is, the content of this activity is not just the thing itself. It's the place you're doing it in. It's the time of day. It's all the objects around you. It's those people and nobody else, and so on and so forth. Uh, in, um, as we move to Aristotle, um, at least some of that content has disappeared because now we really can talk about uh, a whole set of very qualitatively very different things in formally identical terms. We have evolved abstractions such that, um, uh, such that uh, we can uh, apply our descriptions indifferently to different types of content. So, Poesis can describe a pot making, but also writing tragedies. Uh, nonetheless, there is still content in the whole, the content dominates the whole Aristotelian scheme uh, by, th by way of the final cause and the formal cause. That is, uh, that ultimately is the place of content, and that ensures that uh, this picture of activity will always remain dominated by a certain type of activity, will never be able to be completely abstracted. But clearly, when we get to um, when we get to, to division of labor of this kind, uh, uh, this is applicable to anything, and uh, it, there need be no uh, there there need be no links kept with um, with uh, content. And indeed, we develop, uh, and this is on in all kinds of activity, and it's also present in uh, in literary theory and literary criticism and and we'll certainly have occasion to talk about that uh, later on. Well, I think we're all uh, somehow uh, both, both tempted and driven by an ideal of, um, of description or of thinking, which would be an ideal of ultimate formalization. That is, uh, when you have to say, uh, for example, uh, uh, you give a description of a certain uh, novel. Uh, now, when you find yourself um, saying that uh, Conrad um, was thinking about this in this particular year, and uh, uh, after all, that was the year this or that happened, and uh, you feel a kind of vague guilt about doing so, because uh, uh, that, uh, that's anchoring your, your description to a form of content that's, a kind of, that's sort of irreducible, and hence uh, uh, you, would, you would have preferred to make a description of the book which really uh, was so uh, completely formal in a, in a good sense that, uh, that it didn't fall back into those, um, into, into those uh, facts. Or if you like, uh, you know that description, uh, was it, is it T.S. Eliot's description of Henry James? Uh, he had a mind so fine no idea could violate it. Well, that's, um, that's sort of a description of, uh, of this uh, ideal of formalization. That is, uh, uh, it's a mind that's not, not uh, um, enslaved to, to the baseness of, um, uh, of content. Well, certainly uh, abstraction in the modern world is, um, uh, is uh, attempts to approach 
uh, a state of absolute formalization, that is a state of um, uh, understanding activity such that any activity could be substituted for, for any other, uh, and then any person could be substituted for, uh, for any other doing it, and, and so forth, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, and what's, um, uh, or to take another kind of language, uh, it's a kind of um, uh, extirpation of otherness in general. That is, otherness is what doesn't fit in here, and so you have to produce equivalence identity and, and get rid of uh, these pockets of otherness that may be archaic, uh, that, 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 are, that have some kind of unique content of their own that resists being uh, sort of placed in... Um, uh, placed in uh, placed in this this kind of grid work that, that Foucault uh, described for us. So even uh, even the insane that are drawn in and quantified and placed in uh, in uh, in um, uh, quantifiable units and and and, and so forth. Now, um, how this comes about, I think it would be a mistake uh, to see this simply in terms of some. Um, some fatal process whereby uh, a new uh, a new organization of the world uh, comes into being uh, in a, in a, as a, as a kind of uh, as a kind of destiny that 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 can't be that can't be accounted for. Uh, clearly, um, it's at this point that uh, the way one accounts for this process. Uh, will give the clue as to one's um, one's ideology or one's one's vision of history. Um, uh, I will say, um, maybe I did say it the last time. I don't know. Uh, it, it seems clear that uh, the way Adorno and Horkheimer explain this ultimate um, uh, organization of the world in in terms of quantification and so forth uh, is uh, through. Fear of nature, fear of uh, weakness, uh, the need to have control, to dominate nature, and so on. Uh, Foucault, uh, it seems to me, uh, in Foucault, it's it's much less clear what uh, the ultimately determining instance uh, for him uh, is. Uh, it's it, it was clear, I think, that um, the military discipline is only a kind of as I said, is a, one of the material interpretants of the process. It's not thought to be a cause. That is, it's not, I think, uh, because of, in Foucault's picture of things, because uh, armies were trained in the in the uh, Ancien Regime style, a little by little, through in the 16th century, that suddenly the modern world appeared. Um, it would seem that in Foucault, uh, the ultimate level of of uh, causality has to do with. Uh, power's own inner logic, that is the way in which mechanisms of power tend to perpetuate themselves. But even uh, because uh, uh, once you grant him, it's like uh, Descartes' um, picture of, the, of the, the relationship of the world to the deity, once you grant him the beginnings of this modern organization of power, then the whole uh, mechanism uh, is self-explanatory because it is a it is it has its internal dynamism and it tends to perpetuate itself to refine itself to produce its own means of, of uh, reproduction of itself and and so on and so forth it's the question of how it emerges how we pass from sacred power to this quantified power that's not clear and I think again probably uh, we have one of these uh, breaks that uh, that uh, the, the, that that um, the order of things gave us much more dramatic pictures of which is, in a way, a refusal of, um, uh, a refusal of historical uh, explanation. Uh, then there would be other ways of talking about this, no doubt. Uh, I think it seems to me that the fundamental one has to be, uh, has to have to do with the organization of work itself. And the uh, Marxian explanation of this has to do with the coming into being of labor power as a commodity. That is to say, um, for Marxism, the uh, ultimate explanation of, uh, of, of the quantification of the world can only, uh, and also our possibility of understanding uh, the, this, uh, this process, of our conceptualizing 
uh, these abstractions to the point where we can make a theory of them and understand them uh, in, in, in terms of, um, of some ultimate abstraction. Uh, this conceptual possibility is dependent on a development in the objective world, in the real world, which has to do with work itself. point uh, when uh, in uh, Marxist uh, in Marxist phrase uh, for labor is substituted labor power that is labor is still uh, is still activity right uh, and there we're still in the realm of, qual of qualities labor is what you call things that you are doing or you have done so uh, you, when you when you're uh, when you're building a, a furniture uh, you're not doing the same kind of thing uh, as you were when you were uh, planting a garden or, or, uh, or writing a paper, something of that kind. Um, uh, each of these things is qualitatively different, and we're back in the world of use values. We're back in the Aristotelian or even more archaic scheme in which these things are rigorously uh, incomparable because they're all different as their, their content. Each one of them has a different kind of content, and the content of carpentry is radically different and thus ultimately incomparable uh, with the content of uh, writing an essay or, uh, or repairing a car. Um, but on the other hand, if we haven't begun to work yet, uh, at that point uh, one can compare these various activities. And what becomes comparable at that point is not the work itself, the qualitative uh, activity, the activity that has content, it's simply the power to do that activity. Uh, and this is the crucial distinction in Marx between labor and labor power. It's the moment at which uh, labor can be, uh, can be sold uh, and therefore can be thought of in terms of uh, a quantifiable thing of which you sell amounts which are then divisible uh, and to which then you uh, attach uh, various prices and so forth, uh, it's at that point that some ultimate, ultimate process of abstraction seizes on human society. And it's also at that point that, uh, that one can look at human society and for the first time see it transparently and understand what makes it function. Uh, and it's at that point, therefore, that there is the discovery of the labor theory of value and of the very nature of, of human production and of, and of history itself. That's not possible before then, because before then, all thinking is somehow limited by, this, um, uh, by, uh, by the um, non-conceptualizable variety of, uh, of activities. And it hasn't yet become clear how all value has, has its origins in the same thing, namely human labor. Until you have uh, a concept for human labor, you can't understand the relationship of everything in the world to labor. But you can't have the abstract concept of labor until labor has itself become abstract, that is, has become labor power. So these things are all uh, tied in together, and this, uh, this is uh, the very foundation of the Marxist, uh, his, uh, of Marxist historicism, that is, a relationship between uh, seeing, uh, being able to understand what makes a society function uh, and the place in history that you occupy, it, it is not possible for Aristotle to have seen these things because uh, in his historical position he doesn't yet, he doesn't, uh, he isn't contemporaneous with the kind of abstraction we're talking about. And it's also an example, if you like, of the nature of the Marxist but also the Hegelian dialectic that um, this is not a, this is neither a good nor bad thing. That is, uh, I've been describing quantification abstraction in a bad sense as a dehumanization, as the loss of qualities, the, 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 the production of the identical, the same, and so on and so forth. Uh, and no doubt that's true. But on the other hand, our understanding of the process is also, which 
has to be positive, presumably, uh, was also dependent on this increasing abstraction. So one has to look at it dialectically, that is to say, no longer in the moral terms of good, uh, good or evil, uh, or of, uh, uh, but, 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 in, but in historical terms, which are terms of um, uh, irreversibility and of historical, and of a historical dynamic that, that has nothing to do with that, with those ethical, moral judgments anymore. Okay, now, uh, the form that uh, is ultimate, that, that's, that, that's take, that one, another way of talking about the form that's taken by this process of abstraction is that of uh, an um, even more influential in many ways, at least in, in, uh, in the way we, in the university we talk about these things, uh, is uh, that developed by Max Weber under the idea of rationalization. Uh, rationalization is uh, Weber's word for this, um, for uh, this way of reorganizing activity. In Weber's vision of history, um, and I won't say a lot about that, I, I, I referred you to this, to this essay of mine that's over on our reserve on, on this subject. Um, it is a vision of history, and uh, behind all of these concepts is buried or repressed a certain his kind of historical narrative, which one can very rapidly summarize like this, and one can find this on every page of Weber, really. It says the same thing over and over again. Uh, once upon a time, there was an organization of um, activities in terms which we've been calling qualitative, dominated by use value, and so on, which he calls tradition-oriented. Uh, uh, activities were not, had not been thought through in any kind of rational way. Uh, people, uh, it was felt that people always made things like that. They passed on this knowledge. Uh, the, the, the functioning, uh, the production of society was, was based on, um, uh, on, therefore, on traditional, unexamined, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, on a traditional base. Now, uh, in, our, uh, in our moment of society, activities are rationalized, which is to say that when you get it, you, when, when a traditional type of activity survives into the modern world, there still are some, but most are subject to a kind of ruthless rationalization where you say, well, uh, why don't we break this up, like Descartes, break this up into its um, most smallest divisible parts, reorganize it, put it together more efficiently, uh, and so forth. And, and, and what comes into being is the world that, that, that we're living in. Now, um, Weber, like Foucault, needs a theory of how you get from one to the other. But un unlike Foucault, he has such a theory. And this is what uh, uh, this is what's called. Uh, this is the place and the function of the concept. The other famous concept that Weber is associated with charisma, uh, because what charisma really is in Weber is this moment of transition. Uh, the charismatic figure uh, is neither uh, a, 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 a um, an inhabitant or a citizen of a traditional world. You don't get charismatic figures in, um, in village societies, um, nor is the charismatic figure a, um, uh, a, um, an inhabitant uh, or a, a, a species of rationalized societies uh, because there's no room for such, a, for, for such individuals in a, uh, in a system in which uh, activity is, is blocked off and, and quantified and worked out in this way. What happens is that uh, such a figure, and in general, uh, this figure is a prophet, uh, hence Weber's interest in the sociology of religions, such a figure uh, arises uh, as uh, is part of the ruse by which history destroys the older traditional organization of society and pulverizes all of those uh, immemorial ways of doing things in such a way that then all of those activities lay open to be reorganized in a rational way. So the, uh, the charismatic figure is what I've called a, um, a vanishing mediator. That is, uh, his function in history is to, to break up traditional society uh, and then himself to disappear 
and to be replaced by uh, a bureaucracy. So, you, so uh, the older forms of magic are tradition-oriented forms, the ones we've just seen. Uh, lore, is, lore is handed on down. You know that um, uh, if you, you want to uh, kill a certain kind of animal, you have to perform certain kinds of sacrifices and so on. Uh, in our time, uh, we have all kinds of rationalized ways of killing animals and getting food and, and so on and so forth. In between, there emerges the religious reformer who destroys the older beliefs uh, and thus prepares people's minds and also their activities for what's going to happen to them when, uh, when they enter a rationalized uh, organization. So rationalization is the other great um, sociological concept which has been developed to describe the process that we're, uh, that we're concerned with um, here. Now Weber, uh, Weber sees uh, sees either, and this is ambiguous, either a privileged manifestation of ra rationalization uh, or a privileged ex example of it. That is, this is either, this in some places looks like a, a basic historical cause uh, and in other places merely a kind of illustration of how rationalization works uh, in the phenomenon of bureaucratization. As for him, bureaucracy is uh, the supreme way in which uh, a society rationalizes it itself. And this is, uh, it's very ambivalent uh, from an emotional or feeling tone affect point of view in Weber. On the one hand, there's a great deal of admiration for, uh, for uh, heroic rationalization. Uh, bureaucratic, the bureaucratic organization of society is an efficient way for human beings to master their collective destinies and to um, uh, and and to uh, and to organize themselves and and indeed uh, um, uh, we are remember still in a in a tradition the German tradition of Dienst or or the British uh, notion of service and so forth uh, kind of 19th century aristocratic tradition in which. Uh, Bureaucracy and bureaucracy is a place into which uh, the aristocracies of the of the countries which didn't have middle class revolutions <coughs> go, and therefore uh, there is a certain vision of bureaucracy which is not uh, uh, which doesn't have the overtones that the word inevitably has for us, where automatically uh, it's thought to be bad and and. Uh, and to be gotten rid of at all costs, and, and so forth. Weber's view of bureaucracy is therefore not altogether, not altogether negative. Uh, uh, and uh, you have to read the things he says, for example, about Chicago's, uh, about the organization of Chicago's machine politics. And uh, because he visited Chicago about 1900, I guess it was the same then as it is now. Um, and machine politics, and the way the wards are organized, and, and the, whole, the whole political system. You have to read the, uh, hear the admiration that he has for this supremely bureaucratic organization of human activity uh, to understand that this is not, uh, not only a negative thing. On the other hand, there is the famous passage, and I wanted to, wanted to read it to you, but I haven't been able to find it again. It's, it's, it gives to Arthur Mitzman's psychobiography its title, The Iron Cage, and it's a passage in which one of the great sort of emotional outbursts in Weber where he says if this, this is an irreversible process, this process of rationalization, bureaucratization, and uh, it, it can never be done away with. And thus, he says, an iron cage is settling down over human life or over humanity, and, and people are henceforth being increasingly standardized and so on. So clearly, that's the other side uh, of, of the notion both of rationalization and bureaucratization, which is uh, something that we respond to probably even more, uh, and which makes up the ambivalence of this, of this notion for him. Now, uh, I want to say that um, in, in, in passing that uh, there is a very strategic displacement here. If you, um, if you see rationalization as being the result of the development of bureaucracy, then essentially you are uh, giving, uh, in the long run, a political explanation of the emergence of the <coughs> modern world. Uh, and this has very different consequences in the long run from uh, a, uh, an economic explanation from the one I just gave in terms of, uh, of the indifferentiation of labor power. Because um, if the political level is the dominant level, then indeed we're always in, th this is a kind of absolutely closed system. 
because all one can imagine is total organization. These are Weberian terms that find their way into Adorno, by the way. Uh, his expression, the, the organized wor world, the, the verwaltete Welt, the administered world, is the, the, uh, the Weberian description of the bureaucratized world par excellence. If this is the, uh, if this is the logic of, uh, of development, uh, it happens in all societies, whether they're socialist or capitalist. Uh, and so it has nothing to do with modes of production and revolutions are, are useless in that sense. And thus, ultimately, the only kinds of gestures uh, that one can make uh, of a political kind are, are anarchist gestures of, of protest or, or negation or whatever. And, and there comes to be uh, a link between this notion of a total system and uh, ideals of terrorism and, and, um, and, and violence and so on, which uh, is certainly everywhere, which is present also in, in Foucault, in French thought, in Baudrillard, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and certainly is implied in, in Adorno, if not, uh, uh, if not present in exactly that, that form. Okay, now uh, I want to... Um, um, let me give you a final version of, of all of this, uh, and then we'll go back and, and see it. Um, uh, or let, let, me, let me do two, two, two things. First of all, uh, the other way that Weber describes this, uh, and then we generally tend to talk about this, um, this ultimately formalized uh, process, which is rationalized activity, is in terms of the so-called end-means split. Now, uh, we've seen that the Aristotelian four causes had a place for ends, and it had a place for means, but it also had some other things. That is, it had raw material, uh, and it had um, uh, and it had purpose, uh, or it had form, I guess. Now, uh, it would seem, therefore, and I may suggest this in this essay of mine on Weber, but I would say this a little differently. Now, it would seem, therefore, that what you have when you pass from this fourfold set of causes to to breaking down all action simply in terms of ends and means is just a simplification. That is, it's not really a change. And after all, Aristotle talked about ends. And, and uh, now I would tend to say that, that that's, not a, that's not an adequate way to describe this, this concept or to describe what it, it, what it is intended to, to, uh, to, to convey. It seems to me that uh, the thinking of things in terms of ends and means is a radically different way of thinking about activity than the, than, the four, uh, than the four causes for this reason, that the end, as we saw in Aristotle, is still imminent to the activity. When you talk about ends and means, it seems to me that what you're saying is um, essentially you're suppressing the older qualitative notion of ends. That is, even the end itself is drawn into the means and becomes, uh, and becomes um, uh, part of the means. Now, that's sort of hard to think because we keep the two words and we, we talk about distinctions of ends and means, and then we say, yeah, but once you make that separation, uh, you can't put them back together again and so on. Uh, there are more adequate ways of talking about that, and that must explain, I think, the, the contemporary success of a, of a somewhat different term that's come to be associated precisely with the, the, the thought of the Frankfurt School, namely the concept of instrumentality. You see, a concept like that allows you to um, uh, get rid of this problem raised by going on using the word end. I mean, if you talk about things being organized in terms of instrumentality, then it's clear that the old-fashioned qualitative notion of an end, which would correspond for the Greeks to use value, uh, and which would then put a limit on that activity and on its fragmentation and so forth, that that's gone. Once you're in a world of instrumentality, uh, ends are themselves just, just more instruments. And so this term instrumentality is a very useful one in implying a very radical uh, shift and, a, and, and indeed a break with older forms of organization and not, uh, and not simply a continuity with them. Now, it does have some, um, it does have some other problems, namely that it... it, it projects a kind of vision of history of its own that, that we'll get to later on. But, uh, but I think uh, it's a good way of suggesting, uh, once again, this, this movement from archaic activity to rationalized, modern, quantified activity and the, uh, the absolute breaks uh, involved in, this, um, uh, in, in these 
three or more stages because I don't, I, I wasn't really uh, trying to project a, uh, a, a three-moment vision of history, but only to, to illustrate stages of this, of this whole process. But it's a discontinuous process, that's what I want to say. Um, now, uh, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to observe before we, uh, before we go on here, um, must have been going to write it, yeah, uh, on, on this non whiteboard here. Uh, the other uh, kind of um, code that I've found it uh, stimulating to think of this changeover in terms of is drawn from information theory. It's the distinction between analog and digital. Uh, and I think you can find it, Bateson uses it a lot, but uh, the best place to find a, a kind of uh, description of what it can do and what it means is in Tony Wilden, <coughs> excuse me, Tony Wilden's book, System and Structure. There's a chapter called Analog and Digital. And in fact, we might, if, if enough people want, we could make a Xerox of that and, and put it on, uh, on reserve. Essentially, um, this suggests that there are two kinds of thinking uh, and two, two uses of sign systems which are radically different from each other. The analog one uh, is one which is sort of like the Freudian unconscious in that it doesn't have, um, in that it only knows qualities. Everything, it's as though certain kinds of things, certain kinds of um, things are absent from analog counting uh, and analog thinking. One of those is the zero. There is no concept of the zero in analog uh, counting. Uh, another is the subject. There are no pronouns. There are no shifters uh, in Jacobson's sense of uh, that those odd ways in which uh, we insert ourselves into language. That is, language is general, uh, but we still have content, are in unique situations, so we have to use these funny words, pronouns, which change their place and their meaning and their function every time anybody else um, uses them, whereas the rest of the sentence doesn't necessarily. So, uh, but the an analog, um, analog language um, doesn't know uh, shifters. That's why in the unconscious, um, there is no point of view, oddly. I mean, I can be in a dream as a character. I can see myself, uh, but I'm not really, uh, I'm, there isn't the perspectival relationship to the world, which there is in, um, uh, in, um, in digital thought. Uh, well, it, with digitalization, then, all of this changes, uh, and suddenly we get precisely uh, speech uh, and, and mathematics and everything else in its, uh, in its modern sense. It's sa said, for example, that animals have analog languages, or that animal languages, the ones I alluded to, the bees and so forth, are, um, are uh, essentially lack their difference from so-called natural languages that we, uh, what we speak, is, is precisely the absence of, of these digitalized uh, things. Uh, it's, this would also correspond, if you know Lacanian psychoanalysis, uh, in a very general way to what Lacan calls the imaginary, which is an analog relationship, and the symbolic, which is a digitalized, uh, a digitalized kind of thing. Now, I... Um, I use this uh, not so much as a, uh, not so much as a, uh, uh, if you like, this is sort of serves as something like this material interpretant of Foucault, that is, it's a kind of, uh, it's not a real theory because I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not an information theory person, so I don't believe in the scientificity of this necessarily, but I find it a useful material interpretant in the sense that uh, it comes in the middle of our discourse like a kind of alien language in the way in which Voloshinov talks about the role of alien languages like Latin uh, or, uh, or Arabic in, in Turkey and so on for, uh, for some of the classical religions. You have to have a closed uh, language that functions like an object which is somehow central uh, and which can be commented, interpreted, and so on uh, to, um, to, to preserve your, your monopoly of interpretation. Well, in a sense, using... Uh, or, or the other way around, you know how, um, how the, uh, the structuralists like uh, diagrams and drawings, and remember Foucault's, uh, Foucault's various diagrams in, um, in Les Moyes des Choses, 
Are all of those things allow you to insert into your discourse something that has a kind of material solidity and that can function a little bit like a, uh, like a, uh, like a material interpreter? And, and maybe it's in something of that, uh, of that uh, way that I use this, uh, this uh, concept, which I historicize as a movement from one uh, type of history to another. That is, uh, in, when we're talking about primitive society, we're essentially talking about an analog world, a world which doesn't have abstraction. And, and analog is another way of talking about, um, uh, and is, it was a different way for conveying the things that I was trying to say by using words like quality and so on. When you talk about digitalization, uh, on the one hand, you're talking then about a new possibilities of organization, new connections that are made, new ways of cutting things up and making boundaries and so forth. But you're also talking about the emergence of negation, uh, and also the emergence of the subject. Uh, and so that's another, uh, that's another thread that I want to follow through Adorno and Horkheimer, um, since it's one of their basic ones and also one of the ones for which they're the most criticized. The relationship then between rationalization, quantification, uh, and the emergence of the subject. The emergence of the ego or of psychology or of the subjective. We already saw one, one uh, possibility of talking about that emergence when we're talking about Descartes. If you have to, if in order to posit the quantifiableness of everything, that is to say the application to reality of, um, of mathematical models, um, if you have to posit um, uh, extension as more basic than other modes of sense perception, then uh, you are in effect sealing off those other modes of sense perception and calling them and creating something like a subjectivity, which wasn't there before. Before you make that distinction, you don't have a subjectivity that's separate from the rest. Uh, but after, the, after, that, after that reorganization of things, you have on the one hand quantifiable reality you have the world of objective reality, and then you have coming into being, it was never there before, uh, a subjective realm where my individual thoughts and feelings uh, have some, they, they certainly have existence, but they have no particular validity, they're limited to me and so on. So really uh, there already we can see the emergence of something like a modern subject, something psychological as opposed to something real, objective and so forth. Uh, and we can see how it emerges in relationship to quantification, extension, uh, and the like. And this will be then a, a, a very fundamental uh, um, theme of, of the Frankfurt School, the, 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 the production, but then the dissolution of the subject, the, the quantification, the instrumentalization of the subject. Now, in between the Weberian description that I gave you and the other things which are even more distant, and uh, the, um, the account of Adorno and Horkheimer in Dialectic of Enlightenment, there is, another, um, there is another stage, another step, another uh, work which is, uh, which is very important, and that's Lukács' uh, History and Class Consciousness, and particularly the essay on reification. Reification, uh, I think you can see now, is simply Lukács' word for rationalization. It's not... Uh, uh, it's, it's a very suggestive mutation of the Viberian concept, but Lukács really doesn't go nearly as far with it as we would be tempted to do today after the work of the Frankfurt School, who are among those who really developed this uh, in, in, the most interesting, uh, in the most interesting form. Lukács doesn't mean by reification uh, that other Marxian uh, term alienation. Alienation is, um, it, it describes the, uh, uh, although obviously they're linked, right? That is, these, these two phenomena are not, uh, are, but they're different ways of, of cutting across a, uh, a similar phenomenon. Uh, alienation, as we know, is, uh, it is described by Marx in, as, in, 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 as having four, four features, and it describes what happens to modern, uh, to, to, uh, to, the, to the relationship between uh, what happens to the worker in the modern work process. Uh, he is alienated from uh, his product, 
because it doesn't belong to him. He makes it and somebody else sells it. He's alienated from um, uh, his own labor power because he sells it and it doesn't belong to him. He's alienated from his fellow workers because he becomes, he enters into competition for, with them to sell his labor and so on and so forth. Finally, he's alienated uh, from his own production itself, that is from, uh, from what Marx calls his species being, from his very, uh, from his free and, and creative um, uh, practice of, uh, of, of production because all that has been uh, instrumentalized. Reification in Lukács' sense, uh, comes at this in a different way. It comes at this as in, in, by describing the way in which the, the, this process of rationalization, uh, one of the results of this process of rationalization, which is to make, turn processes into things, to turn uh, activity into something that you can break up and measure and, uh, uh, and, um, and which therefore becomes opaque and uh, which therefore becomes increasingly difficult to understand because you're mesmerized by the surface appearance of, um, of rationalized um, organization. Uh, now, one of the, 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 the basic, uh, one of the basic, um, we'll want to extend this further, I think, when we come to talk about the relationship of all this to culture because clearly, um, and this is already, I think, one of the, the keys to the, to the power uh, of Adorno's uh, notion of the culture industry, uh, the culture industry, uh, what's paradoxical about the concept of the culture industry is that it amounts to instrumentalizing something which can't be instrumentalized. Uh, it amounts to, instrument, to making a thing or reifying something which isn't a thing, which is uh, what? Language, images, uh, forms, whatever. Uh, so, uh, so we'll come back to the notion of reification when we see the, uh, the, what reification does to cultural production, because it seems to me that uh, there's a dialectic that's only partially sketched out here by, by Adorno and the, the, the one must take much further, a dialectical relationship between, um, uh, in, in our world, which is much more totally reified even than, than, that, of, than that of Lukács, um, or at least of the 1900s. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a dialectical relationship between increasing rationalization or reification and the pro production of culture, which then tends to take two forms, that is mass culture and modernism. And each of these, it seems to me, is determined in its very being, not only by its dialectical relationship with its opposite number, but by its relationship to this process itself. On the one hand, by uh, the, the turning of culture into a thing that you can consume, and I mean by that not just a commodity that you buy, but um, something that you consume as a thing in the very process of reading it and so forth. Uh, and the attempt of so-called high culture, which I'm going to call sort of globally modernism, because it seems to me it corresponds to that, uh, the attempt of modernism to preserve its autonomy by not being, by constructing itself in such a way that it can't be turned into a commodity, that it can't be thingified or reified or, or consumed uh, in that way. And of course, that's a very desperate attempt, which is a kind of failure and um, historical failure, and uh, which I think now, maybe at the moment when one can see that relationship is disappearing and all these things are being in some way, uh, since the older modernism is gone, and in some ways uh, there's a kind of new stage in this whole process which is one of homogenization between all these things, but that's a, that will be something we'll be talking more about next semester also. Um, okay, uh, so uh, Lukács's notion of reification is going to be important for us in understanding um, cultural production or new and original forms of cultural production. Uh, I'll want to talk about Conrad a little bit in terms of that, perhaps tomorrow or perhaps the next time. Uh, and then also in terms of this other basic theme, which is the subject, because Lukács points out as well or better than anybody else uh, the way in which the subject has to be quantified in order to fit into the production process. That is, you can't, uh, if you have, um, 
if you have a cottage industry, I guess, or you have handicrafts, you really can make allowances for the fact that uh, so-and-so has talents that, that such and such another person doesn't have. And you, can, you don't even want to equalize that. That is, you use each one of them in qualitatively unique ways and so forth. Well, in a, in a, in a rationalized system, everybody has to be interchangeable. There has to be an equivalence at the level of, um, of the agent or the operant. Uh, that is to say, the operative. That is to say that a new, the mind has to be recolonized in a new way. It has to be possible now to uh, invent a form of mental activity in which um, uh, a part of, uh, in, in which only a certain part of the mind can be used and can be plugged into this, uh, into this whole process. And, uh, and that can be described dialectically too, although it, it isn't very often. I, I quoted in Marxism and Form in, my, in the chapter on Sartre a long description about sexual fantasies of, um, uh, of women in, uh, in garment making industries and, and how uh, one can make, a, um, Sartre says, one can make a, a social analysis of this particular, for, first of all you have a dialectical split between work and its utopian opposite, which would be sexuality, which is the place where real private life presumably exists, different from this degraded public life uh, in which you have to just, in which you do this kind of brutalizing mindless uh, work and so on and so on. And, but, but this distinction between public and private, between uh, what you, between work and some kind of real but fantasized fulfillment is itself a product of the system, clearly. That is, it isn't, uh, the, the, that is, the, the, the realm of the fantasy is as much produced, the private is produced by the public in that sense. Uh, and then uh, Sartre goes on to describe how um, the very uh, structure of these sexual fantasies is functional, because what they do is, if, you, if you're too conscious of this kind of work, if you don't fantasize, in other words, um, you, you interrupt yourself and you, don't, and you don't do the work right. You have to be absent to a certain degree in order, uh, in order to function efficiently. And so the sexual fantasy, which looks like a compensation for uh, this mindless activity, is, however, also a way of being just sort of marginally conscious, having something to occupy the rest of your mind while you're doing this and so on. So it is absolutely functional at the same time that it's uh, compensatory. At any rate, uh, surely uh, the production of, the, of the, the rationalized subject in modern society would, uh, if one were able to describe uh, the various forms that that's taken, one would find a great many, um, one would be able to map out the, the, the subject or the ego or whatever in, uh, in, in ways like this because clearly um, at least it seems clear to me, I don't know, maybe it doesn't to you, it's the, the human mind, whatever that is, if it is an object or something, uh, uh, was, uh, was not uh, intended to, uh, to be used in, uh, in, uh, in rationalized purposes, and violence has to be done to consciousness, whatever that may be, in order for it to fit into this, in order for it to become instrumentalized. That's essentially the point. Uh, if you want to describe consciousness as freedom the way Sartre does, then the paradox is somehow reinforced. How can freedom become instrumentalized? How can it instrumentalize itself? Because you have to do it if you want to sell your labor power and so on and so forth. Uh, and one would find this, one would want to trace this instrumentalization through all of the forms of consciousness that, 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 uh, that we find in modern society uh, and, uh, and in all of the places uh, that, in, in all of the places that come into uh, play um, to, uh, to, uh, to compensate for that, uh, for that instrumentalization. And at this point, we're back in mass culture or in, in sexuality or in the various notions of private life, um, uh, what Adorno talks about in here in terms of pleasure, entertainment, things like that. All of these are then dialectical spin-offs of, um, of, um, of this initial rationalization. Okay, um, now I haven't, I see that I haven't really said anything about this book, so um, what, uh, I think we will then probably not get to Derrida next time, so, so let, me, let me say something about Derrida as a way, if not of, um, as a way of clarifying this uh, and marking, a, a giving ourselves a, 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 a kind of, um, uh, 
uh, reminder for, for, for the future. Uh, Derrida uh, took from Heidegger this nice um, uh, way of, of bracketing uh, certain kinds of terms, which he calls surature, under erasure, I think Gayatri Spivak translates that, uh, canceled, canceled out. It's a way of using a word which is, a, which is a dangerous word, uh, which has all kinds of metaphysical overtones, uh, which programs you into something the minute you use it, no matter what you do with it, just by the very fact of using it, uh, but which you can't not use because it's there and there isn't any, any, anything else for it, and you can't think those things unless you pass through that opposition. Well, then you use it by with a cancellation, which means uh, I have to use this because I'm, I'm locked into this epistemy or something. I, I, these are the only oppositions I have. But note that I don't mean it, uh, and that I understand that uh, uh, it is to be repudiated the minute, uh, the minute it's used. The problem I want to raise about Adorno and Horkheimer uh, is, is analogous to this. That is, it seems to me that from one point of view, Clearly, they represent everything that Derrida criticizes in his critique of origins, because they seem to say, once upon a time, there was what some uh, indivi undivided, some some unity of the subject and object uh, before uh, before um, uh, equivalence, quantification, rationalization ca came into being, way way back maybe. Um, then there was this fall into history, rationalization split, the subject-object split, uh, uh, ends mean split, all, all the rest of it. Uh, and uh, maybe, but this they're not sure of, maybe one could go beyond that and find some place in which uh, uh, this could be, in which there could be some ultimate reunification or reconciliation, that's their, one of their uh, key, um, key words, or, or maybe not. Uh, but at any rate, uh, one, has to, um, one has to think about it um, in these terms. Well, clearly, this is a very, um, this is an outright uh, vision of history. That is, it gives us a historical, uh, almost eschatological narrative. Uh, and indeed, one of the, I don't know if I said this the, the other day, I think one of the difficulties of reading this, uh, this work is that, um, <coughs> They, they're sort of, on the one hand, dominated by a Nietzschean taste for aphorisms. I was going to I'll re read you some next time, where each sentence has, has, to, has to have a kind of unity about it and has a, has a kind of polemic and combative unity that tries to uh, uh, make its blow on its, on its adversary is, uh, with, a, with a kind of uh, efficiency and... and, um, and uh, gnomic uh, energy, but at the same time, uh, each of these sentences says the same thing over and over again. And the same thing, the thing that it says over and over again, is a narrative. So these are not only aphorisms, they're also buried or hidden or not so completely buried narratives, and the narrative is the one I just told you. Once upon a time, the fall, and then possible uh, reunification again. Now, uh, I think uh, one, there, there are various ways of, of dealing with this. You can say, uh, well, it's very clear. Uh, this is still uh, in, or Derrida would say, this is still metaphysical thinking. Uh, these people are clearly uh, completely under the spell of the, the nostalgia for origins. They believe that there really was a time once when um, there was absolute presence, when there was absolute indivisibility, all the rest, and so on. And their whole description of modern society uh, is predicated on this belief. Or we can say, no, they're not that, they're, they're, they're smarter than that. They know that there was never such a thing as nature. But on the other hand, they know that unless they talk about it, in, unless they talk about the destruction of nature in terms of some original nature that was destroyed, they can't, in, unless, in other words, they tell this historical narrative, they won't be able to say anything about modern society. So uh, they, use the, they use the concept of nature, but as it were, uh, canceled out, surature, under erasure, uh, as part of the formal uh, necessity of their discourse. So uh, this is what used to be called, I guess, a fiction. They have a myth of the, of, of, of the fall. So that doesn't seem to be a very, very adequate uh, way of describing this. It's a, it's a necessity to, to, to tell this story in narrative terms, to, to, to analyze present day history as a narrative, as the coming into being of something. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to have a kind of uh, 
notion that there was a beginning of something. It seems to me that's, that's the distinction Said is making in his book, uh, Beginnings, uh, between uh, the distinction between origins and beginnings. Origins is when, you, when it isn't suhatur, when you really believe that once there was nature. Beginnings is when you know that, well, a, a, a narrative has to start somewhere. And so uh, we say it as though once upon a time there were nature, but we're using it uh, canceled out. At any rate, that's the, um, that's the framework and the sort of Derridian uh, question that I think it is sort of productive to, to, to put to this book and maybe in, in terms of which uh, we'll look at it next time.